Right, today's service actually is a priestly service. I'm going to try really hard uh, to encourage and to edify and to love uh, you as the body today. Um, but we are in week five of our study and walk through the book of Zechariah. Uh, if you do not have a study guide, I would really encourage you to come up to the table. You're welcome to do it now or do it after service. Please grab a study guide uh, so that you can catch up on kind of where we're at. Uh, and then hopefully use it for some of your personal study as you go uh, throughout the week. Uh, today, though, we're going to be in chapter 3, which is the fourth vision that was given to Zechariah. Now, quick catch up in case you haven't been here. Uh, for anyone that's new, the people of God, right, Israel, have been exiled in Babylon for the past 70 years. They have now returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. In chapter 1, God called the people, if you remember, again and again to return to him. For he was jealous for his people. That's critical. He's not jealous of his people, right? He was jealous for his people. Chapter 2, God promises to rebuild his people and to give their captors over as plunder to them. And God promises to dwell with the people and to give Judah its inheritance. That brings us from a very high-level summary that brings us to today. Now, when Brent asked me if I was able to preach a few weeks ago, he teed this passage up as a slam dunk. Uh, Later that day, I think Jeremy texted or commented what a beautiful picture of the gospel this uh, passage is. And unfortunately, that gave me maybe a little too much uh, confidence rolling into studying uh, for this week. Because I got to tell you, I read six different commentaries, and every commentary said something different about something in this passage. Uh, I was talking to Nick yesterday, who's obviously preaching in Kennesaw, uh, and we both just kind of laughed, right? It was one of those where, man, we read it the first time through, and that, oh, this is an easy, this is cakewalk. And then you start reading it, and you're like, what in the world uh, is going on here? Uh, The good news is is that there is going to be an incredibly obvious gospel picture in the way that God deals uh, with Joshua and the high priest. So if nothing else, for those of you that like to keep it simple, stupid, uh, sorry for saying that word, apologize, uh, if that's against the rules in anybody's house. Anybody that's a kiss person, we at least got the gospel, and we're going to do that really well. Um, But I need you to also be okay that there's there's some ambiguity. There's just going to be some things that we're going to do this with and go, I I don't really know. I'm going to tell you what I think a couple of the options could be as I've kind of prayed about it and read about it. Uh, But we're just going to have to be with some of the okay with some of the ambiguity. So here's what I want to do for those of you that are note takers and outliners. You know that I like an outline. I like some points. Uh, I don't know if Valiani's in here or not, but I got four points of alliteration today. We'll get to those in just a second. He hates alliteration. Um, But we're going to pray. Then we're going to read the entire text. And then here's what I want to do. I really liked what Jeremy did last week. We're going to go through the text and apply it to the people of Israel in Zechariah's time first. We're going to talk about the historical context and meaning of what the passage is. And then I'm going to do my very best uh, to then talk us through what is the application to us today. So we're going to kind of go through it twice. Uh, is what we're going to do, because as I was working through it, trying to do both at the same time, it was super confusing. So again, we're going to break it up. We're going to do Zechariah first, and then we're going to go back and apply it to ourselves. All right, so here's the outline for any of you that like alliteration. Here's what we're going to see. We're going to see an accusation of sin. We're going to see an acquittal of sin. We're going to see atonement for sin. And then we're going to see acceptance by God. So accusation, acquittal, atonement. And acceptance. Let's pray. Dear Father, uh, dear Lord, I thank you for today. God, I humbly come before you. Uh, really of no worth to be up here, Lord. As we talk about the way that you removed Joshua's filth, the way that you gave his priestly garments back, Lord, the way that you call us to walk in your way and to keep your charge. Lord, as we look at the deeper meanings of this passage, God, I fall so short. Um, And I'm sure everyone in this room agrees that we all fall short. But God, I'm so thankful for you. I'm thankful, Lord, for the way that you have redeemed us, that you and you alone have cleansed us. God, you and you alone have made us right before you. 
God, please speak through these words today. Uh, ignore or remove me from the stage. And God, may, may your word be what is heard. May your message be what is heard. And God, may you be glorified today. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to read uh, Zechariah 3. We're going to read the whole thing. It's only 10 verses, 1 through 10. Uh, and what I want you to do is I want you to be on the lookout for the obvious gospel foreshadowing and imagery. Unfortunately, the change of life has caught up to me, so Brent, you'll be happy. I've got the super big words today. Uh, my bifocals are no longer working. Doug, I'm glad you found Kimberly. She moved, so uh, I'm glad that you found her. That's good to see. Uh, so here we go. Zechariah 3, 1 through 10. She paid me to like call you out, just so you know. Uh, so then, verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, this is Zechariah, Zechariah said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. Verse 6, and the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are a sign. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts. And I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. All right, so here's some key characters that we're going to see in this vision. You should have picked these up. First, we have the high priest Joshua standing before God, and it feels like a courtroom setting. There was debate, actually, about that in the commentaries, is like what is kind of the setting here. But I landed on courtroom setting. The angel of the Lord, right, we know this is pre-incarnate Jesus. Satan, the accuser, those are both, uh, those are both right, adjectives of Lucifer. Lucifer is the actual angel. Satan means the accuser. So we see Satan, the accuser, or Lucifer, standing ready to accuse Joshua. We then kind of hear about Joshua's friends who sit before him. Those are probably the other priests. If Joshua is the high priest, that means there's probably other priests around. So the thought process is these friends are his other priests. And then we see down 8, 9, 10, the servant, branch, and the stone. So I'm just going to say, not so easy, Jeremy, just so you know. Not so easy, okay? Uh, but let's tackle verses 1 through 5, uh, where we're going to see this accusation of sin, acquittal of sin, Atonement of sin that leads to this acceptance by God. Now, in order for God to dwell with the people again, their sin of disobedience and the defilement of living in Babylon must be dealt with. It must be dealt with. Look back and read with me again, Zechariah 3, 1 through 5, quickly. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, Lord, rebuke you. O Satan, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you. Is not this a brand? That also means stick. Is this not a stick plucked, right, or snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed in filthy garments. We didn't get to that word, but you can underline that. Clothed in filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken... Your iniquity, you can underline that too, away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. You can underline that also. And I said, Zechariah, let, let them put a clean turban on his head, and they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord was standing by. 
So who is Joshua, this high priest? Right? He's, he's not Joshua and Caleb. Right? We're hundreds of years past that. Just to clarify, who is this Joshua, the high priest? Well, we know that he's the son of Jehozadak, who was the son of Sariah, who was the chief priest at the beginning of the exile. Now, Sariah is executed by the Babylonians as the exile begins. So Jehozadak goes to Babylon, and and Joshua is raised in Babylon. This makes Joshua the grandson of the pre-exile chief priest. So we're like the third generation of chief priest, at least with Joshua. Joshua's acquittal and cleansing are critical because we see this in Haggai as he and Zerubbabel lead the people to rebuild the temple. Now his name I think is pretty cool. Don't miss this. It's also, I found it a little funny to be honest. Uh, Joshua in Hebrew is Yeshua, right? Which we all know, right? Means Yahweh saves. The high priest whose name means Yahweh saves is about to be saved by Yahweh. It's actually a really cool kind of wordplay and picture there when you understand his role as high priest, how filthy and dirty he is. The fact that his name means that God saves. And we're going to see here in the next few verses that God does save him. Joshua is on trial to specifically answer for the sins of the people and the priesthood that led to the exile, along with the continued defilement of living in the pagan land. Now, what we don't know in this passage is if Lucifer or Satan has already made his accusations of Joshua and the people. We have no idea kind of where we are brought into this courtroom scene. Is this the very beginning? Has God just assembled everyone together? Or are we in the midst of, of a conversation that has already happened? Right? Unlike in Job 1, if you remember where God and Satan talk about Job, there's a very clear dialogue that we're brought into between God and Lucifer. Here we don't see that. But let's be honest, does Satan really need to say anything as the accuser? Think about the Israelite people. Where have they been? There's been 400 years of wickedness, idolatry, and betrayal since Solomon. And it ended with these 70 years of exile in Babylon. Also remember, the northern ten tribes have been scattered and lost. And only the southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, remain The sins of the people and the sins of the priests were more than apparent. So Joshua, the high priest, as a representative of the people, stands before the Lord, accused and completely defiled. There is nothing that he can say or do. He's guilty as charged. Without a word being said, Joshua is guilty. But God, right? Two of the greatest words in all of Scripture, but God. Before Satan could even speak, Rebuke Satan in verse 2. Look at it again and underline. The Lord has chosen Jerusalem. Rebuke you. Right? The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord has chosen Jerusalem. Rebuke you. Before the trial even begins, the defendant is acquitted. How can this be? How how can it be? There's There's been no testimony. There's been no accusations. Well, again, as you look at the second part of verse 2, it's because God chose Jerusalem. If you look at Deuteronomy 7, 7 through 8, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord had said his love on you and shows you, for you were the fewest of all peoples, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. The Lord has brought you out of a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the land of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Out of mercy, grace, and sovereign choice, God has chosen the people. The high priest and the people are saved. The high priest and the people are acquitted. But don't miss, don't miss the second part of verse 2. This idea of this brand or this stick being plucked or snatched from the fire. Right? Israel is about to be burnt up in Babylon. Right? They've been in Babylon 70 years They deserve to be completely wiped away. But again, God rescues his people. We see similar imagery in Amos 4.11, where it says, I overthrew some of you. And when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were as a brand plucked out of the burning, yet you did not return to me, declares the Lord. 
It's always, when you look at this scripture, and as we look at scripture throughout the entirety of the Bible, right, it's always God who provides for his people. It's never us. Right? We can never provide for ourselves. We, the people, never choose God. If you're really honest with yourself, you never choose God. You always want to choose yourself. Think about what we've seen in history up to Zechariah's time, just quickly. Adam and Eve and their sin. Did they choose to run back to God? No, they hid in the garden, afraid of their nakedness, ashamed of their nakedness. So it was God who came to them with the first sacrifice. Noah and the ark. Did Noah just instinctively seek out God and decide to build this boat? No, God chose Noah to save a remnant of people. Joseph's role in Egypt. Did Joseph choose to be sold into slavery or be thrown into jail for false accusations? No. But God uses Joseph, again, to save his people. Moses in the Exodus. Moses is hiding for committing murder. And God calls him from the burning bush and says, Moses, go free my people. Joshua and Caleb entering the promised land. Of the 12 spies who went into the land, they were the only two. And God says, you will be the two to lead my people into the promised land. David's rise to power, the lowly shepherd. He had no aspirations to be king, but God chose David. Solomon's wisdom and wealth in building the nation. The nation of Israel wasn't built because of how great Solomon was. The nation was built because God gave Solomon the greatest of wisdom. God has always been the provider of and the protector of his people. So again, we see that Joshua has been accused, but he's also been acquitted. And now, as we look at verses 3 through 5, we're going to see his atonement. Read with me again, 3 through 5. Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed in filthy garments. Again, that should be underlined. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, Remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. And they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. Exodus 28 speaks to the priest's garments. And Exodus 29 speaks to the consecration of the priest. The priest must be spotless and blameless to enter God's presence. God says that Joshua is acquitted, not guilty, but he is still defiled and covered in sin at this point. Right? He's acquitted, he's forgiven, but he's still covered in his filthy garments. Now I cannot underscore the vulgarity of the word filthy here. If you were to look at the Hebrew... The word picture here is being covered in human excrement and vomit. Exactly. Yeah, any of you with a weak stomach, sorry. Um, Not only is he covered on the outside, but he's covered also on the inside. If we were to read 2 Kings 18.27, what we see here is that Jerusalem is surrounded by the king of Assyria. This is during Hezekiah's time. And the Assyrian king's messenger tells Hezekiah his people are doomed and they will eat their own dung and drink their own urine. For Hezekiah will not deliver them. But because of the faithfulness of Hezekiah, Jerusalem is protected and the remnant survives for a little longer. The imagery of conquest though, right? This imagery, this threat, when we conquer you, you will eat your own dung and you will drink your own urine. Right? It's total defilement of the people. It kind of, for maybe a more modern example, it kind of makes me think of Andy when he's escaping the prison in Shawshank Redemption. Everybody seen Shawshank Redemption? I need a quick hand. If you haven't seen Shawshank Redemption, just don't talk to me. I don't relate with you. I don't know, I don't know what world you're living in if you've never seen Shawshank Redemption. Um, but right, but think about it. Andy's in the basement and there's a thunderstorm. He has the rock. There's the big sewer pipe. And every time the thunder claps, He smashes the rock. Eventually the sewer pipe cracks and the pressure releases and it spews sewage all over him. And then the next crazy imagery that makes me laugh, he like sticks his head in the pipe to look which way he's supposed to go and he crawls in to escape. Right Again, vomiting the whole way because that had to be like the most utter filth you can ever imagine. 
But that's, that's Joshua standing before the Lord, covered on the inside and the outside because of the sins of the priesthood and the sins of the people and the defilement of living in Babylon. In the book of Haggai, we see that Joshua plays a key role in rebuilding the temple. So if he's going to lead in the restoration of the temple and the priesthood, he must be cleaned. He has to be cleaned. Accused, acquitted. Verse 4, atoned for. The atonement of his sins in verse 4. The angel of the Lord says, remove the filthy garments. The angel of the Lord says, I have taken your iniquity from you. The angel of the Lord says, I will clothe you with pure vestments. Now, there's nothing Joshua can do to cleanse himself or to cleanse the people. Again, he's totally dependent on the Lord. These are all actions taken by others and applied to Joshua to show his absolute helplessness to remove his own sin. Joshua is given the garments of salvation and the robes of righteousness. And what a beautiful picture that is. We'll see in Isaiah 61.10. It says, I will, greatly, uh, I will greatly rejoice in the, Lord, my soul, in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom himself, like a priest, with the beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. So he has been covered with the new, pure vestments of the priest. And then in verse 5, right, almost as if Zechariah is anticipating what's coming next, he speaks up and he says, hey God, don't forget the turban, right? He calls to put the turban on Joshua's head. If you'll please put the picture up on the screen of what the priestly garments look like. This is the priestly garment, Right, with the turban being the capstone, right? The turban completes the priestly garments. You can leave it, actually we'll go to the verse. Exodus 28, 36 through 38. You shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it, like the engraving of a signet, holy to the Lord. Right, this is like the final stamp of approval, this gold plate that's on the turban that now says Joshua is holy to the Lord. And you shall fasten it on the turban by a cord of blue. It should be on the front of the turban. It shall be on Aaron's forehead, and Aaron shall wear, shall wear any guilt from the holy things that the people of Israel consecrate as their holy gifts. It shall regularly be on his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. So the turban is critical because it is the ceremonial headpiece that carries the pure gold plate, again, with the engraved seal that says, Holy to the Lord. So it completes Joshua's atonement and it completes Joshua's acceptance. And it restores him as the high priest. So being acquitted and atoned and made clean, Joshua can now fulfill his duties and thus offer atonement for the people of Israel. Because of his atonement, Joshua is now accepted by God. He has been made right. Now that Joshua is cleansed, the angel of the Lord gives him a charge in verses 6 and 7. This is a really cool kind of if-then statement. There are two ifs, and there are at least two thens, but some commentaries break it into three. Uh, so we're going to read it here. So look at me with uh, verses 6 and 7. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you walk in my ways, right, that's first, if you walk in my ways... And keep my charge. That's your second if. So walk in my ways, keep my charge. Then you shall rule my house, have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Now the debate is, maybe this rule my house and charge my courts are the same thing, uh, but some commentaries break them up into actually three. So let's look at the two if statements and then the, the three then statements. If you walk in my ways. God is telling Joshua to live his life according to the statutes and the decree of the Lord. Right? This is a call to be impeccable. This is a call to have total integrity and a complete spiritual life. This is a call to be above reproach, to be set apart. This is a very personal, deep, spiritual heart check. 
This is God saying, Joshua, your heart must be right to be my high priest. Your heart must be right to be set apart. Your heart must be right for me to use you as the high priest. And then second, if you keep my charge. This is God's call for Joshua to faithfully execute his duties as the priest. This is a very practical and literal charge to Joshua. Fulfill your role as the high priest. Do what I have commanded for you to do in Numbers 3 in your Levitical duties. Do what you are supposed to do as the high priest. So we see God's two charges are a spiritual charge. Be right. Basically, be a man after my heart. Be right. And then do what you have been instructed and taught and commanded to do. Now, Deuteronomy 8 and in Deuteronomy 10, we see the same two charges given to the people of Israel, which I thought was kind of cool. If you remember, Deuteronomy is the original five books. It is the Pentateuch. They would have had this before the exile. So this has always been an expectation of God's people for both his priest and the people of Israel to keep his ways and to keep his charge. He has always said to his people, make sure your heart is right and do what I have commanded you to do. Keep your eyes focused on me. So if we do that, if the people do that, here's the then statement, then God will provide these blessings. The first one was rule my house. Joshua's high priest will have sole authority over the temple. Right? The high priest will be in charge of the temple. What we see here is God restores Joshua's place or restores the place of the high priest is what he does. The second is charge of my courts. The high priest will have rule over the people because this is a post-king, post-exile period. There is no king anymore. So the high priest will have rule over the courts and rule over the temple. And then the one that had the most debate as I was studying, access among those who are standing here. Joshua will have access to the Holy of Holies and the heavenly court, which that's the addition, right? He'll have access. Remember the setting of where we're at. We're standing before the angel of the Lord. We're standing before God. We're standing before the other angels in the presence. So God says here that you will have access with these people. So this is one of those interesting things because his role's been restored. He's going to have access to the holies of holies, which would be expected as the high priest. He should have access to the holy of holies. But it seems that God has given him extraordinary access to the court of God. He's given him something extra. Now, there's no other detail given as to what that means. We don't know. Does that mean that God's going to talk to Joshua in his dreams? Does that mean that God's going to audibly answer Joshua's request? Like, what does that mean? I, this is where I just need you to be okay going, I don't know. Because if we go too far out on the limb of presumption, right, then we end up falling off into some kind of heresy. We have no idea what this means. What we do know is that his position has been restored as high priest. He now has access to the Holy of Holies. And he has whatever this extra access is to the court of God. Verses 8, 9, and 10. This shifts from the present with Joshua and the people to a future promise. Here we see two additional characters that we've already mentioned. I'm going to give you three names, but there are only two characters. Service, I'm sorry, servant, the branch, and the stone. If you look at the punctuation there, servant and branch are the same person. My servant, the branch, right? Same person, and the stone. And the stone. In verse 8, we see the angel of the Lord tell Joshua and the men before him that they are a sign. The priest will live as an earthly example of the consecrated holiness and atonement for sin. We know this sin, we know that this sign is to be a foreshadowing of Jesus, the great high priest who will cleanse his chosen people for all of eternity. The servant, the branch, and the stone are also all Old Testament descriptions of the coming Messiah. If we read Isaiah 42, 1, we see it says, Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring for justice to the nations. 
We also see in Ezekiel 34, 23, point to the servant. And then in the New Testament, we see in Matthew 12, 17 and 18, and Matthew 20, verse 8, an affirmation of Isaiah's description of the servant to come. So Jesus is the servant who came first to serve the Father and redeem his people. And then we also know that he will return to establish his eternal role, his rule. Now the branch here, the branch is a reference to Isaiah chapter 11. Again, Isaiah 11, 1. There shall come forth a shoot, or a branch, from the stump of Jesse. And a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Spirit of wisdom and understanding. Spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. So out of the line of David, a king from humble beginnings will emerge to serve the people. And that king is the branch. Jeremiah 23 verses 5 and 6 promises that this branch will come. And Jeremiah's letter is written in the middle of their 70 year exile. So those of you who claim Jeremiah 29 11 is your life verse, just know that 70 years of exile come with it. Right? It's all about context. It's all about context. You can claim it all you want, but you're asking for seven years of exile when you do it. (laughs) Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In these days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which the Lord will be, by which he will be called the Lord is our righteousness. So this brings us to verse 9. We have the servant and the branch. And this brings us to verse 9 where I wanted to throat punch Brent and throw something at Jeremy. It's the stone. Every commentary I read, and I read six of them, had a different opinion of what the stone is. I talked to Nick yesterday. We were kind of laughing about how we first read the passage and thought that we agreed. This is a slam dunk. This is going to be awesome. And then we started reading and we went, I have no idea what any of this means. Uh, And we kind of commiserated with each other yesterday, talking through each other's outlines. Uh, But some believe, here are the options. Some believe the stone to represent the cornerstone of the rebuilt temple, which makes sense, right? Zechariah is in Jerusalem. He's there specifically to help Zerubbabel rebuild the temple. Plausible, plausible thought. Some believe that it's Jesus as the cornerstone. Because in verses 8 and 9, 10, uh, we're kind of in this foreshadowing of the servant, the branch, and now the stone. So some believe that it's Jesus as the, corner, as the cornerstone. Some believe that it's a capstone, right? That when the temple is complete and the people have returned, here is the stone, this is the capstone. Some believe that it's a jewel for Joshua's garments. Because if you remember in the high priestly picture, The high priest had 14 jewels on him. And nowhere have we read in the restoration of his uniform, right, of his vestments, we haven't read anything about jewels. Because each of the jewels had a name of the tribe carved on it. Twelve of them did. The other two were on the breastplate. So as I've studied, I've come to believe it's one of two things or it's a hybrid of two things. Uh, So uh, here are my thoughts. And I would encourage you to study. And would love to have conversation of what you think also. First, in historical context, it's a jewel for Joshua's garments. That's where I kind of landed. And these eyes are facets. If you think about how a jeweler cuts a diamond or cuts a jewel, right? They cut edges on it to give it its shape. Well, those edges are called facets. And it's the same word that we see here for eyes. So it's very possible that that's a jewel that is given to Joshua for his high priestly garment. There's evidence to believe that the stone with the seven pairs of eyes or the seven facets, right, seven times two because they're pairs, represent 14. And what do you know? We get back to the 14 original stones. I don't know if we're going out too far on the branch of presumption or not, but but that's kind of where I stopped and went, okay, I can do do that. I like that. Uh, And the commentator also wrote uh, that here, the reason there's only one stone given, as I've already said, The other ten tribes are lost to history. 
So we now have, even though it's Judah and Benjamin, we, don't, we refer to them as one. Right? We refer to them as Judah. So this is the jewel representing that Judah is saved, that Judah has survived exile. So possibility one, the stone is a priestly garment, is for the priestly garment. And inscripted on it is Judah. The second representation of the stone, I do believe, is Jesus. It fits really well with verses 8, 9, and 10. This is obviously a foreshadowing of Christ. Uh, Jesus is the cornerstone, with the markings of the stone being the markings of Jesus, of being whipped and beaten and being nailed to the cross. Those could be the markings that are represented on the stone. This too has strong evidence as it fits the eschatological view of the coming Messiah that we've been in in these verses. Additional support for this belief is found in the idea that the servant, the branch, and the stone all represent Christ. Again, they all are an Old Testament representation of who Jesus is. So those are your two opportunities or two possibilities, at least that I landed on. We also see in verse 9 that the stone removes the iniquity of the land in a single day. Now, historically, this day was the day of atonement. Remember where we are in the text. Jesus hasn't come yet. So when the people of Israel hear this idea of removing of their sins in a day, right, they're thinking day of atonement. When the high priest goes into the temple and offers the sacrifice for all of the people. But then in today's world, right, in our view of Scripture, we see this as Jesus' crucifixion for believers, where sin is paid for, one sacrifice for all, which again fits the idea of this eschatological viewpoint of the coming Messiah. Both are strong and plausible options, and again, I encourage you to study for yourselves. As chapter 3 concludes with verse 10, and Joshua and his friends, they're inviting their neighbors to sit under the vine and the fig tree as an allusion to the eternal peace that the people of Israel have with the Father brought by the servant, the branch, and the stone. They are now free of sin, eternally worshiping and communing with the Lord in heaven. So that is kind of the historical walkthrough of the text. Now, as a modern reader, let's see if we can apply any of this to kind of our context in our lives. I think there's a couple of obvious uh, applications, and hopefully all of you saw the obvious application of having filth removed and righteousness given, right? That's the obvious application. Uh, I think there's also maybe a couple of more difficult applications. But remember our theme here, accused, acquitted, atoned, accepted. Accused, acquitted, atoned, accepted. We do stand accused by the adversary, Satan, right? The dragon of old. And let's be honest, Satan doesn't have to try very hard to find something to accuse us of, does he? Right, we could go down the line of sins, right, which I think every pastor probably likes to do, and I'm going to give you a few just because it feels right, that we've all committed. right? We've all lied. We've all betrayed somebody. Or we've all betrayed the Lord. We've all had an idol in our life or have idols in our lives. Pride, cursing, anger, lustfulness, envy, boasting, self-righteousness. And the list just can just go on and on and on and on and on. You can add whatever your sin is to it. We, just as Joshua and just as the people of Israel, stand guilty. Right? And the reality is we're covered on the inside and the out, just like Joshua, in our own filth and our own sin. There's nothing any of us can say or do to recuse ourselves and to clean ourselves. We're guilty. And apart from Jesus, we stand condemned. Because there's nothing, just like Joshua, right, where God imparts righteousness on Joshua, nothing Joshua could do to impart that to himself. We are in the same position. We are totally dependent on God to give us his righteousness. We don't need Satan to accuse us because the reality is we accuse ourselves with every breath and every day. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, right? We're all sons of disobedience. We all follow the prince of the air. We all live for the passions of our flesh, right? We're Americans, we do what we want to do, because by golly, we're going to do it. And no one's going to tell us otherwise. Right? That's what we do. We fought a whole war so that we could do whatever we wanted to do when we wanted to do it. Not unique to Americans, though. Right? That's all of us as humans. 
but God. Again, the two greatest words in all of Scripture, but God. And you actually see them in Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, even when we were totally filthy and defiled, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Just as God shows Israel in Joshua in verse 2 of Zechariah 3, we see in Ephesians that because of the great love he has for us, he chooses and redeems us. Just as he plucks Joshua or snatches Joshua from the fire and Israel from the fire, he saves us too. Remember in 1 Corinthians 3.15 and in Jude 23, in both of those passages, we see this great idea of being saved just by the fire or being snatched from the fire. Not only does he save us, but he removes all of our filth and our sin. He totally and fully cleanses us. We are completely restored to God because of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Jesus comes all the way to us to redeem us. We have the perfect defense attorney in this picture of an accusation of a court, of the eternal court. Jesus is our advocate. Jesus is our only mediator. Jesus is our only deliverer. But I want to rest here for just a minute. Because look, I know it's easy to speak and to read Bible verses. Some of you are falling asleep out there. Don't worry, I see all of you. It's okay. Sorry I'm that boring. I apologize. But it's easy to read passages and think, oh, these are just easy platitudes. Anybody can give a Bible verse. I have a really good friend uh, whose brother was killed many years ago, and uh, he said that maybe one of the most painful things was when people would come and offer an apology. It was always just what felt like empty platitudes. And we do that all the time as believers, right? We don't mean, we don't mean for it to be that way. I think we're sincere when we say, man, I hope... You know, I'm so sorry for your loss or your loved one's in a better place or whatever it is that we say, right? And, and let's just be honest, that that's pretty weak. When what they probably need is just a hug, right? They just need somebody just to be there present as opposed to an empty platitude. So I realize that as we've read these, scripture, these scriptures, a lot of this could just feel like empty platitude. Because the reality is sin is heavy. I get that. I battle sin every day, just like all of you do. Sin is heavy. Sin is ugly. Sin is filthy. Sin is evil. Sin is destructive. And it pollutes all that we do. And if we're really honest, it leads to immense guilt and shame that can be absolutely paralyzing. Even though the Scripture says we are a new creation, even though the Scripture says... Right? God has cleansed us. That weight of guilt and shame at times can just be overpowering. And I'm assuming that there are people in this room who are thinking all of these verses on being washed clean, redeemed, chosen are really nice. But I, as the pastor, I have no idea what sin you've committed or what you're battling with right now. And you know what? You're right. You're absolutely right. I don't know your deep, dark sins. I don't know what's causing the avalanche of guilt that you're suffering through right now. But I know who does. And again, not as a platitude, but as a hope. I know that God does. Jesus is our high priest, as we see in Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. Right? Jesus gets it. He came to earth as a man. He left the throne room of God to be born as the most fragile of creation, a baby and a manger, to live humble beginnings with carpenter parents who then went on a three-year journey and then ended his life by giving his life out of obedience to be whipped and beaten and nailed to the cross. He knows your weakness but one in every respect who has been tempted. Remember, Jesus was tempted. Satan tempted him in the wilderness. 
and we as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that, he may re- that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Jesus died in our place. He was the righteousness for the unrighteous, as we see in 1 Peter 3.18. So questions to ask. You that are suffering with guilt and suffering with the weight of sin. Was the Babylonian exile too great a fire to be saved from? No. Was the sin of the people in Joshua too great for God to restore and redeem? No. Is your past too corrupt to move forward? No. Is your sin too great for Jesus to clean? No, absolutely not. There is hope for you, and that hope is Jesus Christ. Right, Matthew 11, 28, 29, and 30. To summarize, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Jesus removes the burden of that guilt and of that shame. So as we read about how God restores Joshua and his people, and what little priestly gift I have, I would love to be able to look you all in the eye, to pull you close in a brotherly hug that makes me so incredibly uncomfortable. (laughs) And I would love to tell you in all sincerity, hear this please if I could, if I could hold you all. God loves you. God's redeemed you. Right? God has made you clean. God has restored you to Himself. So let go of your guilt and your shame and hold fast to Jesus Christ. Yes, you're accused, but you're acquitted. You're atoned for and you're accepted. For Jesus came to be the perfect sacrifice for my sin and He came to be the perfect sacrifice for your sin. He paid the price for our sins. He has redeemed us and he has clothed us in righteousness. Be free of your guilt by the grace and the provision of our Lord Jesus. As Romans 8 tells us, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life has set you free in Jesus Christ from the law of sin and death. Now the second application I have, and we're running out of time, so we're going to go as quick as we can, I'm sorry. Walk in my way and keep my charge. The first few verses, verses 1 through 5, I think are a very clear picture of justification through Jesus Christ. 6 and 7 here uh, are sanctification. Puts the onus on us. And justification must always lead to sanctification. James 2, 14 through 26 reinforces this belief that our faith must energize our works. Faith apart from works is dead. We do not get to be armchair Christians. Right? There is no retirement in the Bible. It's beautiful to see our seniors, who I'm not going to name any names, but Paul and Tim and Steve and Rick. And, <laughs> right? it's, it's a beautiful thing to see you guys serve. It's a beautiful thing to see right, that even in the later stages of life, right, that serving the Lord is important. No believer is exempt from the command to walk in my ways and keep my charge. Right? It's time for believers to get out of the stands watching the game and get on the field. It's time for us to run the good race. It's time for us to fight the good fight. It's time to put blood on the ground for the gospel. Right? That is what it is time for. If you've seen Essential Church, it is time to stand firm. But man, again, as Americans, we like it easy. We've grown complacent. I think our revolutionary fathers would smack all of us at how easy life is and how little or how much we take for granted. How is the Lord sanctifying you is what I want to ask you. If the only spiritual exercise you have during the week is coming here on Sunday morning, how does the Lord sanctify you in that? What or who in the Lord is growing you and maturing you? Who are you pouring into to disciple and to grow. Finally, the communion team wants to come on up and start passing out the elements. Let's look at verses 8, 9, and 10 where we'll see the messianic foreshadowing. 
Has the Lord called you and opened your eyes and heart to him? That's the question that I would have. In all the Gospels, Jesus states he is here to serve. Hebrews paints the picture of Jesus as the true and the perfect high priest. Jesus is the branch that came from David. He is the eternal king who will return to establish his kingdom, as we see in Revelation chapter 19. Jesus is the cornerstone. Upon him the church is built and salvation is delivered. We were accused that we have been acquitted, we have been atoned for, and we have been accepted. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to proclaim your word. Thank you, God, for the message that you bring in Zechariah. God, as we're here preparing for a communion, search our hearts, reveal our sin to us, Lord, cleanse us and call us to you. It's in your name I pray. Amen.